If you're old and bald like me, you'll remember back when mobile phones first started becoming really popular, how we were all told it's very bad to use one while driving. That's accepted knowledge now. It is very bad to use a phone while driving. But more and more modern cars are getting all of that screen technology and cars are only getting screenier with more and more essential functions being buried in their infotainment system. So we're here today in the car park at Thruxton Race Circuit to do some science and find out if modern car interiors are dangerously distracting out on the road. Does our obsession with big infotainment screens mean we're spending less time looking at what matters the road, meaning that we're not going to see things like badgers running out in front of us with little badger children on the way to badger school. You're going to run them over because you're fanning about with your climate controls. I don't like running over badgers, nor does Brian May. Now, thanks to the help of a group of scientists from Exeter University and these outrageously expensive eye-tracking glasses, we're going to send a test subject around a simple cone course and ask them to perform a series of simple tasks in the car, such as changing the climate control, changing the radio station, turning off lane-keeping assist and putting the window demisters on. And we're going to use the data from these glasses to work out what percentage of time was spent looking at the road and what percentage was spent looking in here. We're going to test six or seven different cars, hopefully, to get some proper data. So by the end of this video, we'll be able to say which car is most distracting. Let's go. Right, this is Tom, a researcher from the University of Exeter. He's come along with some eye tracking glasses. How do these work? Yeah, so these are some pupil neon eye tracking glasses and they have a number of different tracking systems and cameras that are looking at the position of your pupil and also looking at of a scene camera out in front of you. And we can calibrate these together to understand what you're looking at and how you're taking in information. How do you analyze the data that we get out of these at the end of the day? We'll look at all this data and we'll look at some of the video footage, but we'll also look at some of the raw data and start to look at the areas you're focusing in on, how you're processing information and how efficiently that's all sort of tying in together. So we'll basically be able to see what percentage of the time spent driving is spent looking at the road, and what time is spent looking at the inside of the car. And hopefully we'll also be able to understand a little bit about how that affects your underlying psychological state and your patterns of visual attention. With these, you can actually tell how much attention they're paying to the road and how stressed they are and how well they're driving, as well as just what they're looking at. Yeah, potentially. So the, the eyes often tell us a lot about your underlying neuropsychological state and gives us lots of useful data to look at. That sounds like science. I think we should go and do some out there on our hastily prepared track of cones. Right, this is Charlie, our test subject. Say hello, Charlie. Hiya. Hello, Charlie. So how are you feeling about driving around some cones in a car park? Uh, I think I could do it. I think just about. I think you're going to be all right. Just don't break the glasses. No. They're 10 grand. And if you do break them, we've got some 30 grand backup ones for you to break. I'll try my best not to. I think we should probably get on with it. And by the way, these QR code looking things are so the data scientists can look at where the screen is and all of that stuff. Don't get distracted by them. Let's go. You want to start setting up? Mm-hmm. Charlie's just gone off for his first attempt around the course in a Volkswagen Golf Estate Mark A, which I think has got one of the worst infotainment systems on the market. It's confusing. It's got slidey temperature controls, but we'll see how he's going. So he's got to go around about 17 miles now around this cone course. There's a bit where he's got to go left or right, but he won't know until the last minute. And then it's just a series of meandering turns, a few tight turns. The idea is that he's kept busy driving while doing all the other stuff with the infotainment system, the stuff that you'd normally do while driving. So yeah, it'd be interesting to see. I've got no idea what the data is gonna show. It might be a bust. It might say that cars are great. I don't think it will though. First thing we ask you to do is if you can change the car temperature down three degrees. Okay. Next thing I'm gonna ask you to do, change the radio station to radio six. Radio six. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to turn off lane assist. Okay. Oh my god. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is turn on the front of the on to match. Left it. Well done. Perfect. How difficult was it to use the infotainment system range from one easy to ten? Give it about an eight. Yeah, it was quite hard. How well do you think you drove during the task? I'd give myself a six on that. Right, Charlie's just going off for his second test in the BMW 2 Series Coupe. We'll just cut to a montage now because he's going to do the same test in seven or eight cars, depending on how much time we've got. Let's go. 
I can also ask you to start to change the radio station. Let's turn off my interest. Let's try and find it. Main assist. Ooh, not too sure where that is on here. W assistance. That's on here. No, it's not on right. Oh, I've missed my turn almost. Not easy to find. We might be getting there. A lot more difficult to find that lane assist on this car, I tell you. Turn off lane assist. Want to deactivate. Get that on there. I thought it would be this button here, but it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Can't see in the system here whether or not. Again, struggling to find it in the system. It doesn't appear to be doing anything. Oh, it has now come with red lights. I think that might have done it. Yeah, looks like that might be off. I'm gonna go to this to the list of options. Going to BBC Radio 6. And that is now playing. All right, Charlie, you've done a couple so far. I'm just gonna cut the montage, find out yeah. how are you finding the testing? Some of the cars seem a little bit easier to use or find some of the systems than others, particularly the lane assist. I'm finding that one the hardest one to do whilst actually driving. Charlie is doing laps of this until he's done the tasks and the BMW 2 Series, you were out there for about five hours. Yeah, I was out there for quite a while. And have you found that your driving's got worse as you're fumbling through the systems looking for stuff? When I'm looking for certain systems, most definitely, yeah, I'm struggling to even look where the cones I'm trying to go through sometimes. Interesting, we'll see what the data says at the end of the video. Yeah. But until then, back on with the testing montage. Not too sure if there's actually a way to turn it completely off or if I'm just being silly. That is that one there. Yeah, Radio 6. Turn in, turn that off. See, this time I don't have the little scroll wheel I had on the last BMW, so driver assistance, lane departure warning. There we go, I think that's turned off. That's a fun car. Right, we've come to the end of a long, arduous day scientifically testing these cars' infotainment systems, and it's time for the top-level results. We'll stick some more detailed scientific analysis in once I've got it, but you might be surprised to hear, for the first time ever in a group test, the best car is a Vauxhall Mocha. Yeah, our test subject found this car to be just the simplest to use in terms of its infotainment system, and the data backs that up. It gave Charlie the highest time looking at the road rather than inside the car. The data shows that the Vauxhall Mocha doesn't take Charlie's eyes off the road for as long as its rivals, and when he is looking at it, he's absorbing information easily. Charlie also rated the Mockers as one of the easiest systems to use. Next up, and almost tied for first place with the Mocha, is the Audi A3. Our test subject, Charlie, really liked the big blocky nature of the infotainment layout, and that means, again, he had more time looking at the road than looking down at the car's gubbins. Well done, Audi basically joint first. Here we can see Charlie picking a route then very quickly reacting with his steering inputs and although he's looking at the screen for his next tasks, it's giving him the information he needs quickly and it isn't ruining his natural hand-eye coordination that he's using to control the car. Now controversially in third place is actually the Golf Mark 8, one of my least favourite infotainment systems and actually Charlie did say this was one of the harder cars to find the functions on but the data puts it in third place. He spent more time looking at the road than down at the infotainment system compared to the rest of the cars. He just found the temperature controls a bit fiddly, which is what I've been saying in reviews for donkeys here. So stupid sliders are annoying and there's a climber button, which is confusing. So the eye tracking data did show his eyes darting around quite a lot, but it came third overall. In the Golf, you can see our test subject glancing quickly to the screen and then getting his eyes back on the road, efficiently getting the information he needs. Now, Charlie did admit to being a bit familiar with the Golf system. You can see this because he's looking at the road while using the infotainment system without looking at it. And that just shows how it's vital to familiarize yourself with each car that you drive. Next up, the newest car in this test, the Hyundai Ioniq 5 and It's got 650 horsepower, it's very fast, it can drift. I like that stuff, but actually it did quite well for its infotainment ease of use. Charlie did say it's a bit of a faff initially working out where stuff was, but again, it's got reasonably big things to prod and the data shows that he spent a decent amount of time looking at the road 
rather than at the screen. Or did he? We're about to show you more detailed data, in which case I might just undo all the things I've just said. Let's find out. On this heat map of the Ionic 5's interior, you can see how most of the info that Charlie needed was helpfully located in the center of the screen. Whereas if you look in the top corner, that's the Ford Puma. You can see that the information is all over the place in different areas of the screen. That's not helpful. Now, we're getting slightly towards the bottom of the rankings now. All the cars behind me were pretty good, but the Mercedes-Benz CLA is starting to get to the cars that really are quite distracting to use. Now, Charlie liked this. He just said finding the lane assist turn off button was quite hard. He did say it's actually quite easy to drive. The automatic gearbox is very good, and that did give him more time to look at the infotainment screen. So yeah, quite a lot of time on the screen, but he didn't feel too distracted by it. Let's see that in more detail. Here you can see Charlie's excellent situational awareness in the Mercedes. Despite completing tasks on the infotainment system, he's able to spot some track day enthusiasts intruding on our very seriously controlled testing area. Now the data puts three cars firmly at the bottom of this test. And the first one of those is the Ford Puma. Yes, I know this has just been facelifted with a new entertainment screen, but I haven't got one. So this is the pre-facelift car. Now the problem here was it took several laps to find the lane keep assist off button, which is actually on the end of an indicator stool. Once you've got one of these cars and live with it for a bit, that won't be a problem. You'll remember where it is, but we are testing cold usability here and this did not score well and what's worse the eye tracking data shows he is fixating on things for long periods of time so lots of solid blocks of time not looking at the road not very good showing from this old ford system now you can see here charlie's getting quite bogged down in the puma system and you can see him developing tunnel vision with lots of long periods looking at the screen he's just not able to process the information quickly now, for the past 15 years as car journalist, I've been telling everyone that BMW's iDrive system is great because it keeps your eyes on the road more of the time. But that isn't true anymore. BMW's latest iDrive 8 system in these cars because it's placed them last. The data shows that these cars keep your eyes in the cabin for a much higher percentage than the other cars, which isn't very good. Now, test subjects said that's mostly down to the fact there are so many app icons on the screen. It's like an explosion in an iPad factory trying to work out where the lane keep assist is. It is baffling. The BMW iX1 is about as bad as the Puma, but in a totally different way. It requires lots of small fixations as opposed to a few slow ones. This footage actually looks sped up, but it isn't. Just look at how distracted Charlie's eyes are from the road when he's performing tasks in the BMW. Charlie nearly got it very wrong here. He was looking down at the screen so often and for such long periods, he nearly missed his turn altogether. It's worth pointing out, this was the first of the two BMWs Charlie tested on the day. So it's telling that his time to complete all of the tasks in the iX1 was half that of the two series. So yeah, BMW has come last, which I didn't really see coming. But anyway, we're going to data in a bit more detail, and then we'll drag scientist Tom on camera to talk about some of the other things that we've noticed from looking at the data. As we came to the end of the day of testing, a couple of things stood out from the data. Firstly, familiarity with the car is key. Look at the 2 Series. It was the first of the BMWs Charlie drove on the day, and it took him twice as long to do the tasks as in the iX1, which has the same infotainment system. Secondly, we wanted to find out what's actually safer, an infotainment system that demands lots of rapid flicks down with your eyes to look at the system, or a system that requires fewer, longer glances. And actually, the answer is somewhere in the middle, typically, because you don't want lots of long looks down at the infotainment system because you might run over someone's dog or worse while you're doing it even if it's more efficient to receive information into your brain that way while we've been out here knobbing about in a car park with cones and cars tom research from exeter university has been grinding away in the cabin over there so to speak uh, looking at the data from all of this so tom are there any generalizations you can draw between the worst cars and the best cars do they share anything in terms of the eye tracking data so what was quite interesting was that some of the cars that our participant found more challenging to navigate and use also tended to be the ones that required the most of his attention to be directed towards them right whereas the cars that he generally found a little bit easier to use he could focus more on the road these were more closely aligned or more efficiently aligned with some of the actions he was taking such as his steering movements. Okay, so where he's having to look, that impacts how he steers the car. That's quite a big deal, isn't it, really? Yeah, so lo <laughs> lots of research has shown that the more efficiently that your eyes and hands and steering movements are, the more coherently they're aligned, generally the better vision 
motor control. Are we seeing that the least distracting cars see his eyes coming back to the road more quickly or more frequently? The cars he found most challenging to control, he needed to constantly sort of look back at the display system, which meant that not only was he spending less time on the road, but he was more sort of reactive to what was happening. He wasn't able to align his hand movements, his steering movements as well with his vision. So basically the data is showing that the more distracting your entertainment system is, actually the worse your driving is as well, potentially. Next to university representative, could not comment on that, but I can, I think it's true. Right, thank you ever so much for watching this video. It's been a bit of a mammoth effort to put it together and actually make it vaguely scientific. So like this if you've liked it, subscribe to Motorpoint YouTube channel. Go down to the comments and tell me what your favorite infotainment system is and why you'd still just buy a BMW, even though they've just proved it to be the worst infotainment system in the world. <laughs> Fashion people.